Good evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Friedman. I'm the Health Literacy Specialist with Vaughan Public Libraries. I'm located, despite my background, I'm actually located in the Cordellucci Vaughan Hospital in our library branch found in the hospital, Mackenzie Health Vaughan Library. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have a very special guest today. Uh, before we get into it in earnest, I'd like to first do a land acknowledgement. Vaughan Public Libraries respectfully acknowledges that our libraries were built upon the territory and treaty lands of the Missis Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation per the Toronto Purchase Agreement or Treaty 13. We also recognize we are situated in the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee who occupied this land before the arrival of European settlers. The city of Vaughan is currently home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge their contributions to the life and prosperity of this land. As representatives of the people of the city of Vaughan, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live in this territory. As I said, I'm very excited to host our special guest tonight. Uh, tonight, we're joined by Dr. Jordan Grummet. He is a hospice doctor from the Chicago area. He is the podcast host of the superb Earn and Invest podcast, a show that explores the many aspects of financial independence. And he's also an author. His latest book is called Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. We have a copy at Vaughn Public Libraries. Of course, you can buy it on Amazon, Chapters, and so forth. So please welcome Jordan. Thanks again, Jordan, for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm real excited for this conversation. Yeah, Jordan is a superb interviewer on his podcast, as I was saying. So I'm going to try my very best to do a, a Jordan impression. Uh, I, I When I host people from all walks of life within the medical industry, I usually host them, they do a presentation, I'm in the background. So this is new for me, but it, it's a welcome challenge. Um, before we get into the questions in earnest, those who joined us, you might be familiar with uh, Vicki Robbins' book, uh, Your Money or Your Life. And I think that's one of a superb book to start with if you're thinking about finan financial independence. I think your book, Taking Stock, is actually a great follow-up to that and pairing them to two. And it makes sense since she prefaced your book. I can see the relationship between the two of them insofar as both of them talk about money, but it's really not about money. Uh, but with that being said, uh, because we have lots of people joining from all walks of life, can you uh, sort of just explain sort of general fire movement, the FI movement and the specific circumstances that found you where you found out you're financially independent for everyone? Yes, I definitely can. And even before that, you were mentioning Vicki Robbins' book. When I set out to write this book, I actually wanted Taking Stock to be a mix of Vicki Robbins' Your Money, Your Life and Bronnie Wears the Five Regrets of the Dying. So uh -huh. I saw the two different streams of thought. One is being financially savvy and taking care of your money and your financial framework. But the other was thinking about what people who are dying, what are their regrets and what can we learn from them? And given that I'm a hospice doctor, it kind of made sense to meld those two ideas. So you asked me about the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. This movement really, although it's been around for decades, it's gotten more and more press as of 2008. So there are a lot of people during 2008 with the financial crisis at that time started looking at their lives and saying, I'm working really hard, I'm making money, but this is not how I wanna live the rest of my life. And I'm afraid now because I'm seeing the stock market go down. I'm seeing people lose their jobs. How do I create financial certainty? And how do I build a life in which maybe I can stop working and start doing things I really want to do? Enter the FIRE movement. The idea is to work really hard, make money, invest it until you get to some net worth number. And we can talk about how you calculate that. But once you get to that net worth number, you have a certain amount of assets that are invested. You can then live off of those assets and leave work. So that's the RE or retire early portion. And so this started as something people were doing in their 50s. But as the movement progressed, we started seeing people in their 40s and 30s and even occasionally in their 20s doing this. And so the idea is they mixed both frugality, which is learning how to live on much less with this idea of making a lot of money and investing quickly because you want to take advantage of something called compounding, compound interest. This idea, if you take money and you put it in the stock market when you're 20, 
that's going to be worth a lot of money when you're 30, 40, and 50. On the other hand, if you wait till you're 30 or 40, you have a lot less time for that money to compound and it doesn't equal as much in the long run. And so that's what the FIRE movement is. It has evolved over time, but originally it was really people who didn't like their jobs. We had young professionals, doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, people who kind of were working but felt like they were not living the life they wanted to. And so they saved a lot of that money and invested in the stock market. However, as the movement has evolved, we're seeing teachers and tradespeople and all sorts of people doing this. And they're really utilizing these skills of both frugality, investing, and some other skills, things like moving to a low cost of living area, all these skills they're using there, therefore then to be able to leave work earlier and, and start doing things they want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well said. I, 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 I sort of stumbled upon the FI community was uh, as we we talked through uh, email a bit. My father, he retired before I was born when he was uh, 42. And, and then he had two children after us. And he always was heavy emphasizer about saving. And at least in Canada, you would buy the equivalent of a bond or a treasury in the United States GICs. And back then in the 80s, up until about early 2000, they paid 10, 15% and you could yeah. live easy. But of course you had to save a lot in order to, to utilize that. And so in my case, it sort of brought up that way in so far as uh, to be frugal and the value of things. But more importantly, uh, like you mentioned, and we'll get into this a little later in the conversation about within your job and generally your life is, I, I think FI has really taught me about being sort of conscious of your, your energy. Again, going back to sort of Vicky Robbins' point of, and so I really enjoy my job and want to continue doing it, but there's a lot of sort of the outside, and then there's the, the outside context of uh, the long commute, for example, cutting that down, and so you can utilize assets that either move closer or rent, and you know, and, and, and control your life in that way. So, thanks again for the, the explanation. So let's get sort of more into your book now. Uh, your book sort of posits again. The FI mechanics are really important. Uh, we can. Why don't we briefly talk about you? You mentioned like how do you know when you've become financially independent? So there are a few different ways to do it, but let's specifically talk about the traditional way. The traditional way was again to get to some net worth number that then could support you for the rest of your life. There's been lots of studies about what that number is, how much invested assets you need in order to not work and live off those assets. There's something called the Trinity study. Uh, it was done, I believe, in the 90s. And there's been all sorts of studying of this study. But what pretty much people have mostly decided on is if you take your yearly spending and multiply it by 25, that should be enough money to live off of if it's invested appropriately for at least 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. there's another way of saying that it's saying the safe withdrawal rate of 4%. So what that means is you take your invested assets, let's say you have a million dollars that's in the stock market, et cetera. You could live off of 4% inflation adjusted every year. And that money wouldn't run out for at least 30 years. Now there's some other ways to start thinking about financial independence. And I know Lani that you and I will probably talk about the parable of the three brothers at some point. And it For actually sure. introduces some other ways we can think about financial independence, but the traditional way is to really kind of grind it out, save a lot of money, get to that net worth number. And then that number will sustain you. Yeah. And it's interesting too, if I recall from uh, not only your podcast, but some within the space of that Trinity study of uh, was it the author who updated it saying, at least from the, the last 20 years, how perhaps that was even being a little, you can be even more liberal with that number, uh, depending on your lifestyle and so forth. And it, in other words, uh, a lot of this is adjustable. Like you can either adjust how much you can account for the variable of the return, the general returns of the stock market or whatever asset you're invested in, or you can adjust your spending and lifestyle. I, I think that flexibility is something we often harp on as we're going through a, a, uh, a bear market right now. And we'll see whenever it recovers, it will eventually, we don't know when, uh, but knowing that you can control a lot of things is quite empowering. And so I think FI actually really outlines what that really means. So let's let's go get into your book a lot more now. So I think what's interesting about your book is there are so many books that talk about the mechanics 
like buy index funds or how to do real estate, et cetera, et cetera. Yours touches upon that and it does it well. But I think like psychology and money and so forth, the ones like your book that really focus on and I think do it a great service to the reader is talking about all the auxiliary stuff or what we think is auxiliary and why it's important to actually focus on those things. Can So can you sort of explicate um, your, your sort of general thesis is purpose, identity, and connections. If you can kind of talk about that a little more. So what I found is I was a practicing physician who was burning out about medicine, trying to find a way out. And that's how I discovered financial independence. A friend actually sent me a book to read. I read the book and it taught me all about financial independence. And I realized that I had enough money, which was amazing for the moment. But then I kind of felt lost and empty because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to escape medicine and I knew I had enough money. And we think that having enough money will solve our problems, but I had all the same stresses, anxieties, and worries. I didn't have to worry about money per se, but I still had to figure out who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do with my life. That started a process of journaling and writing. I started a blog. I eventually started a podcast. And the reason I didn't want to focus on how you become financially independent, the mechanics, is it's ultimately very knowable. Like if you're interested in trying to figure out how to save enough money to not have to work again, there are millions of resources. There are mathematical formulas we can teach you how to invest. We can teach you how much to save, even though that confounds most people. If they did a few hours of research, they really would be able to come up with that information. What was much harder to figure out was now that your finances are stable, how do you then live a good life? And that's a completely different question. Yeah, We use money almost as a mirage in order to focus all our, tenor, our, our energy on it because it's easy. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is once you get to your money goals, you quickly realize that there's nothing else there, right? You can make higher money goals, but otherwise money is more probably a tool than a goal. And then you have to start thinking about, well, what am I going to use that money as a tool to do? And that's where this idea of purpose, identity, and connections comes in. Originally, I wasn't so clear on what the next thing was, but I was lucky enough to still be working as a hospice doctor. So when I burned out in medicine, I realized I had enough money. I stopped practicing most of medicine, but I kept on taking care of the terminally ill because I found it very gratifying. In fact, it was the piece of medicine I keep doing even if I wasn't being paid for it. Mm -hmm. And that was a sign to me. So when I started spending time with these terminally ill people, I started listening to what was important to them. And interestingly enough, money was not important to them. They, they weren't worried about whether they got that last promotion or spent that last weekend in the mm -hmm. office working. What they were worried about are these things that they never had the energy or courage or time to achieve. These things that were deeply important to them, but they hadn't spent enough of their energy thinking about them or pursuing them. And so I tried to codify that. What does that mean? And what I found is that really what makes us human and also makes us feel really engaged in our life is when we have some sense of purpose and that purpose doesn't have to be life-changing. It can be a small purpose or a big purpose. You can have one purpose in life or many purposes. That purpose could be as important as working on climate change, or it could be selfish, like procuring your own modern art collection, but you need something that drives you that you're interested in. Once you're connected to your purpose, you also have to think about identity. Who are you? Like, I thought I was a doctor and I thought that was my main identity in the world. And yet, as I burned out, I realized that there was this disconnect. I was kind of identifying myself as a doctor, but that's not who I felt like on the inside. It took me a long time to realize that who I felt like on the inside was a writer and a podcaster and a public speaker, a communicator. But the disconnect of trying to live one life when I really felt like something else inside was making me unhappy. And then last but not least, when you kind of have a sense of purpose and identity, the connections naturally follow. So once I started connecting with being a communicator, I started going to personal finance conferences and doing things where I met other communicators. And I knew immediately that I had found my people because I felt more comfortable with them than I had with doctors that I had known for decades. Mm. And so what the kind of dying taught me is that money only gets you so far. It's a tool. 
But what we really want to do is use that tool to live a life of purpose, identity, and connections. And I think that's the real goal. I think if you're going to, I don't like the word happiness, right? Because happiness is a real fleeting thing. But if we're mm -hmm. going to think about kind of self-actualization or contentedness or emotional well-being, we can use all these different words to describe it. But I think that's what that is. It's being able to kind of live in a sense of purpose, identity, and connections and allowing, having a financial framework that supports that so that you don't spend all your money, your time worrying about money as opposed to the other more important things in life. Yeah. Oh, very well said. It's interesting. A couple of things to touch upon. Uh, I think of a quote by Adorno, um, one of the Frankfurt School thinkers. Of, he, he talked about in a part about happiness is oftentimes you really only know you were happy in retrospect. Always. <laughs> yeah. You never, even in the moment, you, you're, that's more satisfaction. And it's interesting to think in this, a lot of in this space, uh, there's a lot of, um, people who look to the Stoics, I like to think of Epicurus in this sense, as opposed to the Stoics, which were very common, but they had some distinctions. And he talked about uh, just trying to achieve a life of not pleasure per se, but the absence of pain. Mm -hmm. And it, that really connects to your point of hospice and you would do it even if it, you did it for free. And, and so that actually brings up an interesting point of what would you say to those who you they they think in your particular situation well you were a doctor and still are you were a doctor you made good money how am i as a teacher or you know someone working part time how do i use these sort of tools when i just don't have enough to sort of stay above water especially with inflation right raising throughout the whole world what do you think is sort of the value here so I like to think in terms of time here, right? So what is our goal? A lot of times we think we can buy or sell or trade time, but we can't. We can't commoditize it. Time is constant. And time passes no matter what we do. So let's take away this idea of happiness and just start thinking about our goal in life should be spending as much of this time doing things we want to do, things that are meaningful for us, and getting rid of as many things that are painful, right? If you think about time slots, I don't, you can call them weeks or months or years, whatever they are, but we have these time slots and we don't have control over them passing, but we do have control a little bit over what we do in those time slots. Mm -hmm. One of our main tools of affecting that is money, right? So if I have lots of money, I don't have to work. So that's something maybe unpleasurable for me that's filling a time slot that I can stop filling it with that because I now have money and I can do other things. The problem is people think that money is the only tool. And the truth of the matter is it's one of many tools. We also have, some people have their youth. Some people have energy. Some people have communities. Other people have passions. Those are also tools. So when I learned that I was financially independent, I was a quote unquote rich doctor. Mm -hmm. I could then use my money to get rid of the friction in my life. I could stop doing those things at work I didn't like. Eventually I stuck with hospice because it was the one thing I did like. And then I started filling in my time with other things I really enjoyed. And so I could hear a lot of people saying, well, you're kind of privileged. Not everyone is in that position. But I would argue that it's a failure to also understand those other tools available to you. So let's say you are a 22, 23-year-old. Maybe you just got out of college. You've got a job that you don't like, but you know what? It pays the bills. And so you have enough money to put food on the table, but not much more. And you're looking at me and saying, well, it's really easy for you to talk about purpose and identity. It's easy for you to talk about getting rid of those things in your life that cause friction. But it isn't for me. And so here's my argument to those people. If you were young, you might not have a lot of that tool of money, but you probably have some other tools. Like I said, you have energy. Maybe you're 23, so you're not married yet. Maybe you don't have kids yet. So you're working your nine to five, your eight to six, and it's loathsome. And you're doing that Monday through Friday. But because you're young, because you have energy, maybe on Saturday, you start doing a side hustle. You take on a passion project, something you're excited about with the intention of A, enjoying it, right? Because we want to spend that free time we have doing things we like to do, right? Those time slots are limited. So let's do something we enjoy, a passion. But let's also see if we can monetize a little bit. And let's do that for six months and see what happens. I figure two things will happen, one of two, right? So mm -hmm. let's say that you make some money on that side hustle and you're doing something you like doing on the weekend. Well, you know what? Maybe you can take that money and start decreasing that nine to five or eight to six you really don't like. Maybe you'll start working four days a week because that little money you're making on your side hustle is contributing to you getting rid of those things that cause friction in your life. 
maybe you build up that side hustle, start doing it all Saturday or all Sunday, but now you can take off two days during the work week, or maybe you can get rid of that job completely. That's like the really great case scenario. Let's look at the other case scenario. Let's say you do that side hustle, something you're really passionate about, and you do it for three hours every Saturday. And after six months, you make no headway and you're not making any money. Well, at least you then filled some empty time with something you were passionate about. You're filling those time slots with things you like to do. Mm -hmm. And maybe then it's time you try something else that you're passionate about and maybe try a different side hustle. The idea is what can we do to create some margin in our life to stop doing those things we don't like. So let's say you don't like side hustling. Could you rent out a room in your house? So let's say you're 23, you happen to own a house or you're renting a three bedroom apartment, you're only using one room and you hate your job. Well, maybe you're not gonna start a side hustle, but maybe you'll get a roommate and maybe that roommate will contribute to your monthly rent payments and then you can work a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Maybe what that looks like is moving to a different city right? Maybe you can take the same terrible job and find it in another city and you still don't like the job, but the cost of living there is much lower. So the question is, what are the tools we have in our life, especially for a young person who doesn't have much money? What are the tools we have outside of money that can then add that margin in our life so we can start getting rid of those things we don't like doing, those things that cause friction? In the case of this young person we're talking about, it's their job, mm -hmm. and then start replacing it with things we do like doing. Um, and I think if we start looking at it that way, even someone who really doesn't have much economic means at least now has a blueprint to start getting more control over how they spend their time. Yeah. It, what's interesting in, in my personal life, one of my friends who was a teacher and he was overworked, uh, he, he, he worked at a private school and, you know, 16 hour days. And I told him, you're working like a doctor, but you're paid as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a really terrible uh, negotiation. And eventually it got to a point where he moved industries. Now he's in the library field. And so he, he makes less right now, makes two thirds less, but he has, you know, three times as much energy and time. And so he's done some tutoring on the side because it's fulfilling to your point about he, what he really liked about teaching was the connection with the students, not all the bureaucracy and the grading and so forth. And so he's not making exactly the same amount, but because again, he's been following similar paths as well as, uh, uh, he's very frugal in his ways, and therefore he's been able to completely switch his life around and to the point of he's not focused on the early retirement because now he's much more comfortable in, in living sort of a good life. Yeah. And that, I think that uh, there's so much value in that. And we're, we're sort of taught this general narrative, uh, certainly in North America, let alone the rest of the world of, you know, money is sort of not just a tool, but the end goal, as you're mentioning. And I like your book really demystifies all of that. And that's partly sort of the general, the capitalist society we live in, which, I mean, there's positives to it too. Uh, but it, it's interesting to think, and Vicki Robin talks about this as well, if I recall in the last chapter within the newest edition of like that community part, and I know her podcast really emphasizes like that too. And if we focus about other ways of relationship building and, and how we can, money is exactly, as you say, that tool. Um, so another thing that brings up, so we're kind of talking about Maslow's hierarchy and so far as if we focus, as we move up that hierarchy, if you have enough money to feed yourself and you have clothing, and then you can slowly um, hit the, the point and he, he sets it up very much as a hierarchy of course. And so you mentioned, I thought this was very clever. You mentioned in the book, you, you want it more flat in the hierarchy. And then you say, it's really about the climb. Could you sort of explain that to the audience, please? Certainly. So if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy or pyramid, it really starts at the bottom with safety, security, and things like having enough food and warmth and shelter, et cetera. And it builds up to self-actualization. And while all that sounds good, you know, my point is that we don't necessarily have to move through those steps linearly. Mm -hmm. um, I have plenty of examples of dying patients that I've taken care of, and I have poor patients who barely had enough to survive and yet had love and connection. And I look at them and they say, you are self-actualized. And then I had very rich people who had millions and even billions of dollars. And yet, on the other hand, they died alone and unhappy mm -hmm. because they hadn't built those relationships and the other important things. So I like to look at it more as a flattened period. Yes, we have to work on getting our finances in order, but you also have to work on self-actualization. In my case, I talk about purpose, identity, and connections. 
But the point is we have to work on them all together. And this gets back to that 20 year old who doesn't have much money. I don't want you to feel like you have to build a huge financial structure to be happy, to have love in your life, to have purpose, to have enjoyment. My argument would be that we have to work on all that together. The finances are a great tool and I want everyone to have that tool to be the people they want to be, but it's not necessarily the roadblock to getting to these other things. So I think we need to flatten the pyramid. I think we need to work on it all simultaneously. I think our financial goals should support those other things in life, but they shouldn't stop us from getting there just because we aren't financially where we want to be right now. And so you mentioned this idea of the climb. The climb is kind of what I actually see as true happiness, which is this idea of having something that's purposeful to you that you enjoy the process regardless of the outcome. So I talk about podcasting a lot about how that's part of my climb. Mm -hmm. So I love podcasting. And in fact, I love getting in front of the mic and interviewing people. And of course, I would love a million people every month to download my podcast, but I can't control that. But I can control my enjoyment of the moment of learning about people, of becoming a better podcaster of learning the trade. So for me, that's the climb because I like the process regardless of what it ends in. I also love this idea of the climb that we can make incremental improvements. So yes, I can't necessarily get to a million downloads a month, but I can increase my downloads by 50 or 100 people every month. And that's something that's imminently attainable. And it's something mm -hmm. where my actions lead to improvement. So if we can find these things in which we love the process and we feel like we're making a little bit of headway, that in a sense is the closest I think we come to that quote unquote happiness that we're all looking for. Um, and again, I think that money enables us to do this because I have money, I can do this as opposed to going to an office and seeing patients, which wasn't as fulfilling for me. Um, but it can be attained without these things too, or we can find jobs or places to make money in which we can do some of these things that feel like climbs to us. Yeah, it's interesting, again, reading your book when you, you sort of outline the climb. I see that kind of a bit as a rejection of the retirement early because you, you mentioned this in many times throughout your podcast of a lot of people, they retire early, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then they, re they realize like, oh, I have this giant vacuum. <laughs> I don't have any anything going in my life. And now I'm feeling sad, depressed. I don't know what to do. And it's interesting that once you retire and whatever format that is, whether traditional or early, uh, that climb, in other words, the whatever progress you're trying to achieve still has to be there. And so cultivating that while you're still working, whatever situation you might be in, it, it certainly it, it leads to a, a better life. Um, so I, I think this is a good time to sort of, we mentioned it earlier about the parable of the three brothers. So this will really outline financial independence and the way to think about it. So if you could please give us a breakdown of that, I thought that was a great para parable. Sure. And before I do, I think Jay asked in the chat room, oh, yeah. uh, what's the name of the book? So it's Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth and Living a Regret-Free Life. Let's talk about the parable of the three brothers. So Earlier, we were chatting about how we define financial independence, and I kept on saying this is the traditional way. So actually, I wrote a parable, kind of a story that gives you an idea of what are the different paths to financial independence. So the parable goes something like this. There was once three very different brothers who set off on a journey of a lifetime by embarking on three separate paths because each of the brothers was very unique, the past diverged quickly. Now, the eldest brother, he was known to be the most efficient. So it was unsurprising he took a path that was straightforward and free from time-wasting roadblocks. The middle brother was a strong hiker but got distracted easily. So there were a lot of detours off the path. He had trouble sticking to the task at hand. And finally, the youngest brother was more of a nonconformist. He didn't move forward too quickly nor get distracted too easily. He was just more slow and deliberate. Now, the eldest brother had a concrete goal in mind because he had no particular fondness for his path. In fact, he saw the end as a destination, a culmination of his struggles. His thirst for finishing was so great that he often skipped meals and even sleep to plod along further. Mm -hmm. He suffered greatly, but 
he made a huge amount of headway in a short period of time. And eventually he got to the end of his path and he had a huge amount of time to enjoy his freedom. Um, the road had beat him up, right? He was tired both physically and emotionally, but it was a sacrifice he was more than willing to make. The middle brother, on the other hand, he also had no particular fondness for his path, but he got fatigued faster, right? He didn't have the strength mm -hmm. or determination of the eldest brother. So he would take a lot of breaks on the way, and these breaks would allow him to increase his energy and rebuild his stamina. And so it took him a little bit longer to get to the end of his path than the eldest brother. Uh, he had less time to enjoy his freedom, but a good deal more energy. And finally, the youngest brother, he didn't see his path as a destination. He actually saw it more as a joyous journey. So he took the time to notice the rivers and the trees, the changing of the seasons and the sun beating down on his head. When the youngest brother got to the end of his path, the end of his road, he did something that neither the eldest brother, the elder or the middle brother could understand. This was many years after either of them had got to the end of their path. He turned around and he walked back the way they came. So Here's what this parable means, at least when it comes to career and financial independence. As we talked about, the traditional financial independence path was the eldest brother. These were people who put purpose identity connections aside and said, you know what, I'm going to do a job maybe I don't love, but I'm going to make as much money as fast as possible. And then once I reach financial independence, I'm going to retire early and then I'll live a life of purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of what I call front loading the sacrifice. It's grinding it out. And it was kind of the more traditional ways to do things. And that's kind of one way of getting to financial independence. However, young people nowadays, they don't want to put off purpose and identity. They want to live today as well as tomorrow. So they are more likely to be middle or youngest brothers. The middle brother is kind of a path of passive income or side hustles. These are people, instead of saying that financial independence is when I get to some big net worth number, instead they say, well, I'm going to create this passive income or side hustles. And once that creates enough money to pay for my monthly needs, I'll be financially independent. In a sense, it's a bit faster, right, than the traditional way, because as opposed to waiting 10 or 15 years and accumulating all that money, a lot of times you can get there within a few years by doing something like real estate. There's a lot of landlords do that. Digital entrepreneurs, people who sell products online, podcasters, bloggers, authors. These are all people who create some of these revenue streams that then can pay them every month. And in a sense, they're financially independent. Now, I call it a longer path than the eldest brother, because even though you have your passive income and side hustles, you're still going to have to maintain those by doing some work, maybe into your 60s or 70s, unless you're putting a lot of money away on the side for retirement. And so that's the path of the middle brother. And the path of the youngest brother is actually the passion play. If we think that the purpose of all this is to live a life of meaning and identity, well, if you come out of college right away and you find a job you love, that you would do even if you weren't being paid for it and it happens to pay your monthly bills, you are financially independent right away. Mm -hmm. And so we see this with a lot of creatives, artists, architects. Um, just like anything else, all these paths have problems, right? The path of the eldest brother, if you die young before you retire, then you're not really living a good life or spending your money up to that point. You know, the path of the middle brother, maybe you can't create these passive income or side hustle income streams. Some people just aren't that talented at it. Or maybe yeah. you do, and then something changes and they no longer provide money for you. Mm -hmm. The problem with the passion play is sometimes you can't support yourself with your passion. I'm thinking of like an artist who paints 100 paintings a month, but only can sell one. You may not be able to support yourself that way. But the point is, that you now think about, if we start thinking about purpose, identity, connections, have an idea of what's meaningful to us, we then can look at the paths of these three brothers and figure out what's the best way forward for us to build a financial framework, but also live a life true to ourselves. Like some people say, you know what, I'll grind it out for 10 years if that's going to give me tons of freedom in the future. Other people say, hey, the future isn't guaranteed. I'm doing something I want to do now. I'm going to go for the passion play. So the three paths, front-loading the sacrifice, the traditional fire pathway, the path of the middle brother, which is passive income or side hustles, and finally, the path of the youngest brother, the passion play. Three different ways to get to financial independence, uh, but all reasonable depending on who you are and what's important to you.
Yeah, and, and it, I think it, it's such a great schema. If you take it that way, in, in addition to a parable, what, what you're talking about is I, I see myself as more the sort of middle slash the artist one insofar as, you know, I'm a librarian, I'm a medical librarian and a public librarian. So I do research for doctors. I enjoy that, save as much as I can, just because a lot of just sort of just generally living, everything's for free at the library. Books, why would I buy a book? Uh, besides yours, <laughs> uh, you know, things are at the library, uh, used to the public services. And so then it becomes of focusing on uh, time. And I, and I think of, again, to your, your parable, I think of my father in his case, that he, he gained lots of weight over the many years. He, he was a heavy smoker. Um, and so the, doing that front loading was very uh, adverse to his health. And so for many years, he had to he had to cope with that in the latter half of his life as a result. And so it's interesting. You can sort of take all the best parts of all three of the brothers and adopt it accordingly. Right. And I think that's quite, that's a good sort of framing. In addition to that, I just want to point this out. I thought this was interesting. This was kind of like a throwaway line within your book about uh, you made a sort of compelling case between weight loss and FI because you were tracking like if we think about FI to your point of being financially independent, it is ultimately a number. It's it, once you understand how investments work. And similarly, in a lot of cases, not completely, but a lot of uh, weight management could be similar to that. And so you mentioned that when you were losing weight, you tracked it on um, some of those apps and, and so mm -hmm. forth. So I'm curious if, if we sort of think of it in, in this general, with that frame, uh, how do you think sort of, being getting interested in an FI, if you could talk a little more about your your father, I think that would be interesting because that would frame this nicely of how you, FI is is not just about money or in the and how it can connect to how you think about everything in your life. And in, in this case, or you, how you did weight management, like it helps you build skills. In other words, yeah, I mean, the the thing about weight management, the reason why I talked about it in the book is this idea of intrinsic motivation versus external rewards. Yeah. And I think we run into this problem a lot of time when it comes to money too. We confuse money as the reward or the goal, whereas we really have to start looking at our intrinsic motivations. That happened to me with weight loss. I started losing weight because I was about 30, 40 pounds above where I wanted to be. And my intrinsic motivation was to feel good and to be more healthy. Yet I started really looking at the extrinsic rewards. In this case, the extrinsic reward was the number on the scale. And mm -hmm. what I found is that ultimately at some point, I didn't feel like I was looking any different and I was losing weight. And yet I was still seeing all the same imperfections in my body. And that's because I had let the tool become the goal. All of a sudden, that number on the scale had become more important than what I truly was motivated by, which is this idea of being more healthy. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that, again, comes back to how we look at money. We get really caught up in the numbers and the net worth and what that means to us. And if the net worth is high, we're happy. And if the net worth is low, we're sad. But ultimately... The real idea is what are we intrinsically motivated to do? These are external rewards we're looking at. These are external signposts that we're using to decide whether we're successful or not, uh, but they don't really mean much. And so I think that kind of draws us back to what's important to us. What do we want? What is this money a tool to accomplish? And how can we put it in the correct framework? So it's just that a tool and nothing more because it doesn't really long-term make you more or less happy. They've done plenty of studies on money. And yes, mm -hmm. there are some levels at which money makes you happy. But once you get to a certain point, it doesn't make you any more happy. Our ability to adapt is amazing. We adapt to good yeah. and bad things. And so we adapt to having lots of money and it doesn't actually move the needle very much. Yeah, the hedonic treadmill, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's such a great parallel between sort of the general skills of once you sort of tack within the space of financial independence, it gets you, it, at least for me, it made me to look at my entire life and to my earlier comments, so jokingly, I don't buy anything. Of course, I buy things, but rather that that's such a auxiliary part of my life. It's going out with people, experiences, especially post, well, post quote unquote COVID um, and yeah. focusing on those things. That's where I spend a good amount of money on. And, and this is sort of a general theme I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, 
within the fire movement. Everyone is talking about vacation or um, doing hobbies, and in other words, allocating time accordingly. I, I see uh, Jay put a question here, uh, wondering this could be a good transition. It said, he said, uh, sometimes can't we live the way we live? Sometimes not very happy, but it makes your loved ones happy. I'm curious if this could, might be a good point to bring up so your artist subtraction that you talked about to, to Jay's point. Yeah, so Jay makes some interesting points there. So first and foremost, I found that the people who love you are less happy when you're not happy. Mm. So first and foremost, I think the premise of that statement, we have to really look at because most of the people who really care about you are going to want to see you happy. So the question also is, is can we live for other people? And I think, uh, you know, some people do define part of their purpose is my purpose is to spend a lot of time with my spouse or to bring mm -hmm. up healthy children or to teach. All those things are important, but I would tell you, and this is a theory of mine, I have nothing to back this up. I think all of us have things that drive us that are exciting and interesting to us that don't have to deal with other people. And so I think it's easy to say my purpose is my family. And I think it should be part of your purpose. But I don't think we should also give up on this idea that we have things that drive us that are innately interesting to us. And they're hard sometimes to figure out, right? You have to do some real soul searching and spend some time thinking about what those things are. But I don't think we should give up on them because I think you know, if your family becomes your purpose, guess what happens? And I see this a lot with people with kids. You know, your kids get older and they have their lives to live. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so as much as you want them to be your purpose and what you kind of do and how you spend your time, you know, when you bring up healthy kids, part of that is that they leave the nest and go build a life of their own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why it's important to not get rid of that as your purpose, but to additionally add other things. And again, what we call purpose doesn't have to be amazingly important. I love reading. Like I spend a good three hours a day reading. And a lot of times I read throwaway detective novels and things like that, but I love it. I mean, mm -hmm. I get so into reading, um, you know, fiction that I just get so excited by it. I love to exercise, right? So I love taking mm -hmm. walks. It doesn't have to be these huge things, but I think we would be remiss in not considering this idea that we have a purpose outside of just being there for the people we love. Yeah, well said. Uh, I'm interested. I think uh, Sharon is sort of on the same wavelength of what I'm thinking of. So you decided, despite being financially independent, to continue doing hospice work. Could you, whether from the book or otherwise, could you let the audience know some, one of uh, a story that really sticks in your head? Yeah. So what's really interesting, and I think Sharon says, can you speak more about your hospice patients and those conversations? Mm -hmm. So what I see is that, and I'll, 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 I'll curb it like this. People tend to die like they lived, right? So people who have happy, full lives tend to have happy, full deaths. And people who have anxious, worrisome lives tend to have anxious, worrisome deaths. So I get a lot of people who say, well, how do I have a good death? Like, I'm afraid. I'm very scared of this idea. Will it be painful? And I say, no, we're getting really good at treating people with pain meds. But often people come to me and they say, how do I live? How do I have a good death? Well, again, we tend to die the way we lived. So the question is, how do you live a good life? Not how do you have a good death? And what I've learned from dying people is when they talk about what a good life looks like, when they do have regrets, it's often regrets that they didn't do those things that were really important for them. So I can't say it's one thing versus another, but I can tell you for some people that's relationships, relationships that went awry and they always knew that they needed to fix them, but they never did. For some people, it's bucket list items. I really wish I went here or did this, but I never had the time and I kept on telling myself I didn't have the money. For most people, it's something that was important to them that they never had the courage to try, not whether they succeeded or failed. And this is a really important point. And I'll bring up a story that I talk about often when I'm bringing this point up. I had a patient named Ernesto and Ernesto was in his 20s and he decided to leave work for a year, take a sabbatical right when he was in the prime of his money-making abilities. People told him that he was stupid, right? They said, no, yeah. you're in your 20s. You need to build your career. You need to save money. You need to put it in the stock market and let it compound. When you hit your 40s and 50s, you're going to be so happy. Don't take this year off. And he had this driving need to go try to climb Mount Everest. So he took a year off. He trained as much as he could. He went to Mount Everest. 
He got about halfway up. The weather changed. It was too dangerous. He had to come back down. And by then he was done with his time. He didn't have any more time. He went back and had a pretty full career up until his early 40s when he was diagnosed with leukemia. Now, can you imagine if Ernesto had put this off and said, I'll do it in my 40s when I'm more financially stable, when I have more money, when my money is compounded? He would have never made it. And interestingly mm -hmm. enough, when you went in to talk to Ernesto, what did he talk to us about? He regaled us with these stories about being on the mountain, being on Mount Everest, what it felt like, what it smelled like, how it was to catch his breath. You see these memories, if we're going to put this in financial terms, these memories compounded, just like mm -hmm. money compounds in the stock market. And they eventually paid dividends, dividends of joy. He didn't care whether he succeeded or not. I mean, ultimately he failed, right? He didn't make it to the top of Everest, but that wasn't nearly as important as that he went and tried to do something that was deeply important to you. If you want to live a good life, or excuse me, if you want to have a good death, you have to live a good life. And if you mm -hmm. want to live a good life, you have to start addressing those things that are deeply important to you and doing them before you run out of time because we don't know when our time is up. We don't know if it's when we're 40. My dad died suddenly at 40. Mm -hmm. For him, it was 40. I'm planning on living into my 80s or 90s. <laughs> no one really knows. But what I do know is if you do get a terminal illness and you are on your deathbed and there were things that you didn't do because you didn't think you had the money or the time, you will regret them. And so then you're going to try to spend whatever weeks or months you have left coming to terms with it. And if you're lucky enough, maybe you will, right? Maybe you won't go to Mount Everest, but maybe you'll, you know, send a family member there and they'll do it in your name, right? Sure. But we don't want to make that last minute plot twist that fixes your life. I'd mm -hmm. much rather have you think about those things when you're young and healthy so you can start working on them now. And that's my kind of goal. Yeah, and it's interesting too. That I'm just making the connection now. Of you called it the climb, and Ernesto, he literally did the climb. Yes, yes, right. And it's not that he hit the peak; it's the apex for him was the journey. And, and that's what it seems so benign to say, but it, it truly is. That's that's the point. Uh, and, and that again, once again, in your book, you say flatten Maslow's hierarchy. And if you tackle all these aspects of your life simultaneously and see that money is a, a really engaging tool, but it truly is just a tool, and that's where it stops you have so much more energy and power over your life. At least you can start framing it that way. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious, just being conscious of the time, if you can sort of discuss some of the tips you mentioned at the end. I, I thought this was so refreshing because once again, to, for those who are on the call, most financial independent uh, books, they do a great job of, once again, all the mechanics of this type of index fund. If you're in Australia, buy this one. If you're in Canada, you can buy these set. If you're in America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is how you can become more frugal and you marry those together and you've, you figured it out. Uh, but in your, at the end of your book, you mentioned like self-forgiveness, slowing down. Could you sort of touch upon some of these things, the ones you that really stand out? Yeah, so the whole purpose of this is we always talk about investing in money and stocks, et cetera. But as a hospice doctor, I have a very particular set of advice for what people should invest in. And money is only a small part of that. Yeah. I think if we really want to look at the climb, if we really want to understand our sense of purpose and identity, we have to invest in a lot of other things. We have to invest in ourselves, right? Which means getting an education. And I'm not talking about going to the top university or getting a master's or PhD, but I'm mm -hmm. talking about exploring the world, whether that be the internet, whether that be arguing with people you don't politically agree with, whatever it is, go out there and learn, take care of yourself, forgive yourself, right? Because we are our deepest, hardest critics, and you will spend more time unhappy because of self-criticism than almost anything else in the world if you are a typical human being, we need to invest in our own self-forgiveness. We need to invest in other people, right? What makes the world go round? It's love. It's the people mm. that we are connected to. It's That's our right. children and how our children carry on our legacy or it's our friends. All those times that we were there for someone and we didn't even think twice about it changed their lives. And they take that goodness and they spread it to other people. And there's this ripple effect where when you put goodness out into the world, when you connect with other people, 
continues even long after you die. And I think that's really important. And so we have to look at these other things that we have to invest in, invest in our bodies and our minds. Like we Absolutely. need to really think about mental health and many of us should go to therapists and talk about those things that are scaring us. That's not weakness. That's actually working through being a human being. Mm -hmm. We should exercise our muscles. I, I feel most people feel no point nearly as calm or peaceful as right after a good workout. Uh, that includes things like meditation and listening to classical music and doing things that connect us to our bodies. Um, and then, yes, we have to invest in the stock market. We have to take our money and we have to allow it to compound. And compounding is the magic that happens when you take your money, put it in reasonable investments and give it a bit of time. And if we do all these things, if we invest in the right things, we're a lot less likely to have regrets as we reach the end of life. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'm looking now. So if those who want to ask uh, Doc G any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Let me read one Jay put, because I think this is a good transition. Um, he talked about, my parents moved here from another country because of education here. They, if um, they didn't like it too much because they lost everything. I'm curious if you're comfortable to talk about your your um, your wife's family, because I thought that's a great story. That, that's a, quite a good parallel to this. So my wife's family came in 1979 from Iran. My father-in-law worked for a company that happened to be very pro-Shah. And so when the Ayatollah took over in Iran, uh, they put him in jail and he was lucky enough to get out. Mm. And they quickly went to Il Italy, got visas to come to the United States and pretty much left everything, all their wealth, all their worldly possessions behind and barely made it out. The story is that one of my father-in-law's colleagues tried to leave the next day and was stopped at the gate and never heard from again. Um, so they kind of barely made it out of Iran. When they came to the U.S., they had no material possessions. Most of their property, everything was in Iran. They lived a very comfortable middle, upper-class life in Iran. But they also didn't have the credentials necessary to be successful in the U.S. For one, they were Iranian, and this was right around the Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, people were not very excited about hiring Iranians at the time. The other thing is, you know, my father-in-law didn't actually have a college education. Where he grew up, you didn't know that. He became a CFO of a big company. He didn't need a college education to do that. So he was very successful. But when he came to the U.S., he didn't have any of the credentials uh, his wife was a teacher. She ended up doing nails and they did whatever they had to do, but they were an amazing role model for me because they made it work, right? They found a way to subtract out all that important stuff they thought was important, the fancy cars, the clothes, et cetera. They lived hand to mouth. On the other hand, they made it work. They sent all three of their children to college. They eventually bought a building and managed it and made enough cash flow from that to move to a fairly nice, expensive area in our in the suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And all their kids ended up being wildly successful, but they had to sacrifice, right? They had to subtract things out of their life that previously they enjoyed. I mean, my wife grew up never eating out in restaurants. I don't think she ever did. Um, and talk about like, if they cook something, you had leftovers for three, four days in a row. <laughs> Nothing went into the garbage. Yeah. Every time they bought something, you know, and they used up whatever food was in the container, that container stayed, got cleaned and got used to pack up other things. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a testament to how you can start living in an, the life you want to live, even in the harshest of circumstances. Um, and I think, you know, that immigrant story is so common, right? We Absolutely. see that. And it's funny because you know, the kids grew up and the parents are like, well, it's a luxury for you to think about purpose or identity or all these things. I just had to like get sure. food on the table. Um, but that's part of that luxury that they gave us. That was kind of what they handed down to us because they came to the U.S. often to make a better life for their kids so they could leave these lead these very meaningful lives. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really interesting to think of because most all of us, I would assume, or most of us on the call are probably pretty disconnected from like the Great Depression as an example. This was par for the course of being frugal and living in a certain way. And it's not until the 1950s with mass industrialization that we become all 
for the most part, very comfortable. And we, we think yeah. of like, oh, being frugal. I, uh, what do you mean? It, yeah. I, I, I'm enjoying sort of these things. And I like to think of, and it's unfortunate for some people to wake up call currently since uh, COVID, besides all the, the medical points of using a lot of the public services that we have. Uh, there's so much information that's free and a shameless plug in my case of the public library. And I know the United States and Canada have some of the best public library systems in the world. And it's something really underutilized. And, and it's something that can not only books like yours, but just the mass amount of information and, and comfortable places. The only place I would argue in a typical democracy that doesn't try to sell you something. And so you going back to these sort of basic things and, and using them, you, you talked about your wife and growing up of really making sure everything was absolutely used before it ended up getting thrown out. Yeah. It, it's, it's a reminder of the power that that actually gives you. Rather, it's not something that should be shameful. It's something that we should embrace because it allows you to do all the things that we've been talking about throughout the whole conversation. Let me touch upon a couple more questions here. Um, Geetha said, my parents feel like they need me really to be part of their life. Can you give us strategies? And again, as much as you might be able to on how to get them to cultivate their own purpose. So this is a big part of the book. And actually at the end of every chapter is a series of exercises that help you work through some of these things. So I talk about, especially in the first chapter, this idea of the life review. So when we have hospice patients and they're dying and we've got their symptoms under control and their family present, all those things. We do something called a life review, which is just a structured series of questions where they really evaluate their life. What was important to them? What did they accomplish? What didn't they accomplish? What were the key relationships in their life? What were their best moments, their worst moments? What do they hope to accomplish in whatever time they have left? I feel like young, healthy people should be doing a life review on a regular basis. And I think it's a really good way to start thinking about purpose. You know, another way, the, the, the really quick, dirty, easy way to do this is, again, pose yourself the question, if you were lying on your deathbed bemoaning your life, what would you regret that you never had the energy, courage, or time to do, right? There's some other shortcuts. What, when was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night excited by an idea? Like, did you pursue it or did you do what most of us do that says, ah, that's a crazy idea and I'm too busy and I'm going to work and doing those kind of things? Yeah. There's a series of exercises you can do to start really thinking about what is purposeful for you. And some of it is literally throwing spaghetti against the wall. So if nothing seems purposeful for you, it's going out and volunteering, becoming parts of groups, trying new hobbies. You know, you can strike out 10 times, but if one thing keeps you busy and excited for even short term, that might be part of your purpose. And again, your purpose can change from time to time. So for many of us, our purpose when we have little kids is just to protect those kids and bring them up and make them healthy. Um, but the kids get older and then you start thinking about maybe I'll go back to work or maybe I'll start doing this hobby again, or maybe mm -hmm. I'll X, Y, or Z. Um, so there are a lot of exercises and, you know, to go through it all here would be difficult, but they are in the book. And there's a series of exercises at the end of each chapter that help us put these things like purpose, identity, and connections into perspective. So we can, so there's some real ways to work on these as opposed to just pie in the sky theory, which some of the book is on purpose. Sure, sure. Yeah, thinking about the macro and the micro within your own life. And a shameless plug for you, I think your book is a great book and workbook, especially for the holiday season. And because Joan asks about like regrets about placing her husband, mother, father-in-law in nursing homes, emotional regrets, the guilt associated with it, like working through your book, among other of these, these type mm -hmm. of um, this general FI community and the questions it poses, it gives you time to really reflect. Yeah. and sort of craft and let me say one thing about guilt this is a whole Please. nother talk i do a whole hospice bed of care talk and i talk lots about guilt guilt really erodes happiness and it is incredibly common for people to feel guilt about medical decisions whether that's placing a family member in a nursing home or mm -hmm. people call it pulling the plug right when you have a family member mm -hmm. who's on life support and you decide to remove that life support I really urge people who are feeling that guilt to realize that they did nothing wrong. They did not put their family member in that situation, often disease or something we can't control got them there. Mm -hmm. And probably the biggest gift you can give to those family members is to let go of that guilt. Because guess what? I see this in hospice all the time. Dying patients, their suffering ends when they die. The suffering of family members can last decades past mm -hmm. that. Well and said. often they suffer because of guilt. And 
usually, hopefully not all, but usually your family member doesn't want you to feel guilt. I'm not saying mm-hmm. all, but most of the time, <laughs> most of the um, time, if, if they want you to feel guilt, then maybe you have to question whether they actually have the purest motives and then putting them in that nursing home or doing those things might've been the right thing anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but just remember guilt really erodes happiness and nine out of 10 times in the patients I see the family members really had the right intentions. And so I focus on intentions. If, if you're doing and making decisions for your family members with the right intentions, it's the only thing you can't control. You can't control the outcomes. You can't control even what those family members think of you. Mm-hmm. Um, but if your intentions are good, try to slowly let go of that guilt because it will take away your happiness. And that that's not the purpose. We, we, we have loved ones. We connect with people to support and love them and help them, not so that we can cause each other guilt and that guilt can last for decades. Awesome. Yeah. That, great insight. Th- here's the last comment. Uh, Darlene, because I mentioned about we haven't, none of us, I believe, have gone through the Great Depression. And so kind of that imprint it makes you, but she says that we may not have been through the depression, but that experience imprinted on us. And it's a great point. Yeah. Generational trauma. So generational trauma is very, very, very common. And the reason why is when a family member, someone goes through trauma, it develops what are called money scripts, ways of dealing with money and ways of dealing with how we manage money. And those money scripts are passed on to the next generation. Let me give you a perfect example. I was interviewing a financial psychologist and this guy spent his whole life having like five different jobs. Mm. Like, and it it was almost like, if I'm not in my nine to five, I have to be doing the side hustle or doing something mm-hmm. until 12 every night. He'd fall asleep exhausted and then be up at five in the morning back to a bunch of his jobs. Being a financial psychologist, he started really trying to think, well, where did this come from? And he realized that three or four generations back in his family, there was this uncle who failed miserably, was lazy, and everyone suffered from it, and it was just a horrendous situation. So what happened is this scarcity money script had been passed on generation to generation about don't be like your lazy uncle. And what that had meant was by the time they got to his generation, you had this generation of kids who thought they had to be working all the time. And if they weren't working all the time, then they were being lazy and they were being bad. Major life events imprint on us and we pass on those money scripts, especially of money scarcity to the next generation. And those can be passed on generation after generation after generation. Mm -hmm. It's money trauma. And we see it all the time. A big part of dealing with your finances is to actually start questioning and start thinking about that money trauma. What are your money scripts? Is it scarcity? Is it abundance? What are they? And what trauma do those come from? And only once you start recognizing that, can you start talking to yourself and saying, okay, is this really how life is? Right? Did that guy really need to be working five different jobs to be successful or to be happy or to be okay? Probably not. Yeah. Okay, we'll make this the last comment. Jay, once again, says anyone you met uh, regret their decisions in which they can do their choices. That's a curious one. So your general hospice. um, Oh, I mean, all the time, all the time. In fact, that's isn't that the definition of regrets? I mean, and again, the hard part is if you leave it to getting a terminal diagnosis, if you only give yourself permission to really think about what you want until you have a terminal diagnosis, you're going to have regrets and your amount of time left over is just not that much. You're not physically feeling good enough and you don't have enough time to really go back and fix those things. And that's why I think we should be thinking about these things way earlier um, so that we can start working on them now. So when we get Mm -hmm. to that deathbed, uh, we can say, yeah, I kind of thought what was important to me and I did it. Successful or failure, doesn't matter. I at least went out there and had the courage to try. Yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, I think we'll end it there. Uh, Once again, thank you so much, Jordan. That was a fantastic conversation. I had a lot of fun and uh, (laughs) I hope you enjoyed it. For those who are on the call, um, I'm glad you joined. We recorded the session, so we'll eventually post it on our Vaughn Public Libraries page. I'll actually send it out when that happens. Uh, to everyone who, because there are a few people who uh, signed up but didn't get a chance to join, so that everyone could look at the archive. You can share it with your friends. Um, please check out Jordan's book, Taking Stock. 
Uh, you can either get it from the library, buy it at Chapters. As I said, it would make a great gift to really go through it. And for some of those who, who talked about, um, I think it, some great deep questions for self-reflection, it could be a, a great thing to, to bounce ideas off of. And, and that's one of those investments that whatever the sticker price of books are or the time it takes to go through this work, to your whole point through the conversation, this is what pays dividends. This is compounding interest. So the emotional and the life you can live. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Jordan, if you don't mind just staying on the line just for a bit before I let you go. Uh, thanks everyone once again.